Hey everybody, we're back with another top 10 video and this time it's British cars. I've had a bunch from a 1954 MG to a 1994 Bentley. So let's take a look at the ones that I was able to narrow down to include in the top 10. I guess when people picture British cars in their mind, they probably look something like this, right? Green with wire wheels and no top. This is a 1954 MG TF. In this design, the T series from MG had been in production since 1936. So by 1954, this car was already looking pretty outdated and having a 57 horsepower motor under the hood didn't help sales either. These cars were also not that great to drive in wet weather. They didn't have roll up windows, but instead used what they called side curtains, which were kind of a pain to deal with. But today, these TFs have a charm all their own, and as they say, it's more fun to drive a slow car fast than it is to drive a fast car slow. This particular car had just come off a 2,500 man hour restoration and was minty fresh everywhere you looked. Other than the addition of a Moto Lita steering wheel, the car was all stock and ready to go find itself a winding road. From about the same era, here's what Triumph was up to in 1956 with their TR3. This was another car with side curtains, but this car here also came with a hardtop, which was an extremely rare option. I've sold a lot of Triumphs from the TR2 through the TR8, and this example was one of the best I've had. This car was bought new in Portland at Rambo Motors and had one owner from new. He used the car as a daily driver until putting it away in the 1980s, but in 2001 he woke it up and commissioned a frame-off restoration. When it was finished two years later, the car won its class at the Forest Grove Concours. Over the following years, the car was driven to a lot of British field meets throughout the Pacific Northwest, and when I bought it in 2018, it had traveled about 9,000 miles since the restoration. This car really hit the sweet spot. One owner, all the records from new, a comprehensive restoration, and then extensively road proven after that. A show car that actually gets driven. It doesn't get much better than that. Now if you want a car that's great on the road, you absolutely, positively have to drive a Bentley Continental R at least once in your life. I sold this car about four years ago and I still think about it a lot. This car delivered a strange brew of crushing performance mixed with strict civility and was totally addictive to drive. Move into the left lane to pass, nudge the gas pedal, and the transmission doesn't kick down. Instead, the Garrett turbocharger instantly spools up and starts to make snarling whooshing sounds until you look down and realize that you've just passed 100 miles per hour. My friends thought I was crazy to buy this car, and they were probably right. These cars can be incredibly expensive to maintain. Even the bill for a brake job will make your eyes water. But this car came with about $13,000 in recent service receipts and ran and drove perfectly. In fact, I can safely say that this is probably the best driving car I've ever had. The Continental R was the world's most expensive car in 1994 with an MSRP of $275,000, which in 2020, adjusted for inflation, equals about $477,000 today. This car had an unannounced debut at the Geneva Motor Show in 1991 and took the automotive journalism world by storm, completely upstaging the new Mercedes S-Class. From 1992 through 2003, they made 1,292 of these cars. Find one. Drive one. It will change your life. Now let's rack it back from six-figure cars and start talking about four-figure cars, which is usually my budget for daily drivers. This car I drove daily back in 2017 and put about 2,000 very enjoyable miles on it. What is it? It's a 1973 Rover TC2000. These cars are common in the UK but rare to find on this continent and had some interesting design features. They were built using a base frame design using unstressed bolt-on body panels fitted to a monocoque structure. The Citroen DS employed the same build design and you can see some aesthetic similarities between the two, especially at the C-pillar. 
This car had 23,000 original miles and all the documentation back to new. It was incredibly well preserved and actually very reliable. The right hand drive layout took a little getting used to, but it had an interesting side effect. It kept you on your toes. When you were behind the wheel of this Rover, you were driving. Not glancing at your phone, not daydreaming, you were operating an automobile. All of the switch gear was laid out so you didn't have to take your eyes off the road, and the interior had a great scent of leather combined with Wilton wool. Getting into this car every morning always put a smile on my face. The comfort of those seats was like settling into a favorite old chair with a cigar and a glass of scotch, but not while driving. Another great driving four-speed sedan was this 1960 Jaguar Mark II. These are hard to find in good condition because the cost of restoring one is about the same as restoring an XKE, which is worth four or five times more. But when you can find one like this, these are great cars and have a lot to offer. They basically have the same drivetrain as the XKE, and for that reason, they were the preferred transport for British bank robbers in the 1960s. Plus, they're seating for five adults and a trunk big enough to hold several bags of cash. These cars are beautifully constructed and well engineered. This one featured a rare Darrington steering wheel that was made especially for these cars and also had the preferred four-speed manual transmission. This was meant to be a driver's car with a full set of gauges and lots of toggle switches to fiddle with. These cars have a nice refined feel to them and don't skimp on the use of wood, leather, and wool. These days, they are the perfect choice for a family car, but back then, Jaguar didn't mind these being thought of as a getaway car. They just chose to describe the car in a different way, the Gentleman's Express. One British car that won't get you anywhere fast, but will definitely get you there, is this 1956 Series 1 Land Rover. This was a frame-off nut and bolt restoration and used a later Series 2 motor, as well as a full Synchro Series 2 gearbox. It had some neat features like a tropical roof and a matching trailer, which kind of turned the whole thing into a Tonka toy brought to life. Underneath, it had a full Rocky Mountain parabolic suspension and was pretty much ready to go anywhere. Parts availability for these vintage Land Rovers is very good, and similar to Jeeps, they have tremendous online resources for information, as well as great club support worldwide. But if you want to join a club that's a little more exclusive, get yourself a Morgan. Morgan has been making cars since 1910 and are still around today. They're making about 850 cars a year now, but if you want one, you have to get on a waiting list. Morgan cars utilize a wooden body substructure made from ash, even to this day. This car is a 1959 model 44. This model started production in 1936 and is actually one of the models that Morgan is still making to this day. This car holds the Guinness Book record for the oldest continuously produced automobile in the world. Morgan named it the 4-4 because it had a four-cylinder engine and four wheels. That's because most of Morgan's production before this car came out consisted of three-wheeled cycle cars. This car was restored by Morgan expert Robert Couch in 2009, and this was the last completed car before he passed. It had an all-new ash body substructure and used a desirable Kent 1600 GT crossflow motor under the hood paired to a three-rail Ford Cortina four-speed transmission. This car only weighed 1,500 pounds. It was fast. This next car was also frame-off restored, but not by an expert. It was restored by me. <laughs> In the summer of 2006, I had a ratty old Triumph TR4 that I like to drive around. It ran great, but had been painted in a pretty bad color. So that winter, I thought I'd go about prepping it for paint. You know, remove the bumpers, all the trim, start getting it ready. Well, one thing led to another, and I went too far. But I learned a lot along the way, and my kid, who was six then, he got to have fun too. I actually got lucky with this car in that it was a really solid original car beneath that non-original paint. This car came apart beautifully with no rusted fasteners or broken bolts. I went ahead and I had both the body and frame media blasted and my painter remarked that he had never seen a Triumph this solid and he's been at it a long time. 
it needed metal repair in only two areas, at the top of the battery box and on the passenger side inner rocker. The driver's side was fine. Getting to see what this car looked like in bare metal was really interesting. I was basically checking out the spot welding that the factory workers in Coventry did all those years ago. So it took me about three years to get it all put back together. And you know what they say about blood, sweat, and tears? I got to experience the first two and almost experienced the third. This ended up being a really nice car. This car was originally red, but I wanted a more British color, so I went with Cactus Green, which was a TR3 color. I ended up selling this car pretty soon after it was completed. I was in it too deep, and the car was almost too nice to drive, so I just had to move it along. But I'm going to find another TR4 to keep one of these days, just a nice old driver, and I won't care what color it is. We'll finish off with a pretty fun little British car. This is a 1960 Morris Minor Traveler, and this car had 200 miles on it since a complete rotisserie restoration. Looking at this car, it'd be like going to the factory in Oxford, England and taking delivery of a new car in 1960. Morris Miners aren't expensive cars, but this one was restored like it was. The Miner was the first British car to sell over a million units, and their parent company, British Motor Corporation, was kind of like the British GM, selling makes such as MG, Riley, Morris, and Austin. This car featured a few upgrades from what was original. It had a 1275cc motor and disc brakes. Just a really nice little car that any Anglophile would appreciate. So if you want to get involved with British cars but need to watch your wallet, Morris Miners are a good way to do it. There's actually one more car on this list of 10. It's a 1965 Sunbeam Tiger, but I've already featured this car in another video. It was my first video in this series, the top 10 vintage cars I've sold. And that means of all time, 20 years worth. I had a hell of a time deciding which cars to include, so if you haven't seen it, check it out. Thanks for watching and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see my upcoming video releases.